a playlist original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thanks for coming back to the podcast today. Whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite audio platform, I really appreciate the support for each one of these episodes. Today's episode is a really special one for me because I am talking to somebody from one of my favorite boutique Blu-ray 4K DVD labels out there, Vinegar Syndrome. On today's podcast, we've got Oscar Bescher. He is the archivist and the vault manager for Vinegar Syndrome. So when they get these really crazy prints that come in and they discover new film reels and, you know, they find stuff literally in people's basements and people's attics, Oscar's the guy who makes sure that all of that is preserved, make sure all of it is archived for future use and make sure that, you know, a lot of these uh, potentially lost films never get lost again. So he plays a a really important role in the world of physical media and just, you know, film preservation uh, overall, because without people like Oscar, there would be tons and tons and tons of movies uh, that would just be lost to time as film stock just, you know, disintegrates really. And uh, vinegar syndrome, you know, occurs, which is where they got the name of their company, which we'll talk about here in the podcast. So I'm going to talk to Oscar a little bit about like what this process is of, of archiving film reels and, and, and how it works at vinegar syndrome the work he does with some other labels and, you know, where they sort of find these things, how these things come to vinegar syndrome, some of his holy grails, things he's looking for. Um, It's a really, really good conversation that touches on a, a bit of a different side of this business that I don't think gets the recognition it deserves. We talk a lot about restorations and we talk a lot about, um, you know, the, the business side of things, but at the end of the day, you know, none of these great releases from vinegar syndrome could even get started unless Oscar was able to, you know, go back and and digitize these files and save these, these film reels and make sure that they're archived properly and maintained and stored correctly. So he's, it's a really, really important role. So I think you guys will like this one. If you don't know vinegar syndrome, definitely go check them out. Like, I don't know what you're waiting for. One of my favorite labels, if you're at all interested in horror cult thrillers, uh, they do a lot of like obscure movies not even necessarily horror but just obscure genre movies all kinds of great stuff over there and some of the best packaging and special features and on 4k simply put some of the best looking discs out there right now so go check them out enjoy this episode with oscar and i will talk to you guys at the end when we're here with our interview i've got oscar besher with me he is the archivist and vault manager for vinegar syndrome one of my personal favorite boutique labels out there love their blu-ray and 4k releases that they've been putting out uh, recently i'm a huge fan so this is super cool thanks for coming on oscar if you want to just give like a little uh background on you and, and you know what your role is at vinegar syndrome that'd be great mm-hmm. thank you jeff uh yeah so um yeah so uh i'm the vault manager and archivist so essentially i wear many hats but only get two job titles <laughs> Um, but essentially for archivist, anything which is on film, uh, that comes into the building, also things which are tape materials, master materials, I have to go through, determine what those are, um, like decide whether or not they could make possibly good releases and then talk to the scanning technicians and the restoration artists to see if we can figure out a way of actually, um, getting these materials scanned and ready for access as vault manager. I basically have to organize a, an enormous, like uh, enormous backlog of materials and basically conserve them. So anything which like ends up in the staging room, which is where we put uh, new films, which haven't actually been cataloged or looked through. I basically have to immediately put it on my desk, wind it through a rewind and see what it is and make sure it is what it says it is. Um, So some of these materials are not owned. Some are owned. The owned materials we automatically can put in a permanent location. And then that location uh, essentially stays in our uh, climate-controlled vault um, because the most important thing is that 
even if we can't put it out for another 10 years, we're caring for the materials until then and after then. So even when it's on your shelves, we're still caring for it afterwards, just in case uh, the worst happens. Like everybody loses their Blu-rays or their DVDs. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much long gist of it. Cool. And so how, how many um, different pieces of media are you sort of responsible for? Like what's, what's the vault up to at this point? It's a lot, man. I think uh, <laughs> the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest portion of it is um, we tried to focus most of our emphasis on materials which are unique and rare. Um, and by that, I don't like to use unique or rare too like, uh, um, often, but what we mean by that is the closest generation to the original camera negative, which is the best possible image. Um, and then anything which is closer to that, so if it's an IP or a CRI, it's a tiny bit closer to uh, making, like, uh, capturing all the actual grain, color material uh, for that. So essentially, a lot of OCMs uh, for VS releases exist here. And then also we care for uh, materials which come in to be scanned, which are still owned by other, uh, other people who are releasing through the company. So if it's on film, uh, it's going to come through the vault or at least the staging room at that point. Um, and then here's my, I affectionately call the inspection room, but it's kind of my office. <laughs> and uh, here are the things where we kind of, right before we scan it, I go through and make sure it's all repaired. It's a more controlled environment, so we can basically go through, check for perf damage, perf like uh, uh, edge damage and repair it so that it can actually run through the scanner. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of material that we just finished 20,000 reels this, uh, um, this uh, I think maybe a, a month or two months back. And when we finally saw that number, all those zeros, I was like, oh, okay, so we're making, we're making a good difference. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that's essentially at 20, 20,000. And we're just gonna keep trying to put more and more into conservation because that's what we care about. Everybody here loves film. No, that's awesome. Then the, the preservation is so, so important um, to not, to not lose these films, especially. And, you know, that's where I'm curious, like where, where does a lot of this stuff come in from? Um, you know, is it, is it just sort of like, I always hear these stories of like, oh, we found a pristine, you know, reel of this supposedly lost movie and like, grandma's attic and she was you know newer producer and just happened to have it like is that is that where a lot of the stuff it just kind of gets found and then is is you know then archived properly yeah so most of the material in our archive comes from my grandmother's attic so uh <laughs> <laughs> no uh uh yeah that's a that's a big part of it um we work really closely with the filmmakers and producers who made these films so oftentimes they have garages full of uh uh, film material, uh, sellers full of it. And obviously, uh, it comes from a lot of different, different routes. Sometimes, um, we go for big libraries and then we get the material from those libraries, those, uh, like uh, purchase of an actual rights, uh, library. And then after we get those materials, sometimes we don't get the best elements of all time. Um, so we have to continue looking for elements even after we have the rights to it. Um, but it comes in all, all avenues. I think um, uh, some materials we get from, a lot, uh, the good news is a lot of it comes without overtly looking for it because if you're just the crazy weird film people who will take material which is, has vinegar syndrome or has really bad mold, uh, I love mold. I, I love the like uh, chemical process of vinegar syndrome i hate the actual end result of it but i love studying it so when you have that kind of reputation like we do we have really great like uh, relationships with other archives too so we work a lot with like some of these these big ones like george eastman museum we just donated some material to them which was nitrate we work with uh library of congress pretty frequently they're really great moma and uh, a lot of these really big archival institutions know that if we have a genre, if they have genre stuff, really good genre elements, then they can send it to us and we'll give it the actual care and 
respect that it deserves. Um, no matter what the state of decay it is, we, we want to just save the film first. So, Yeah, so you mentioned um, Vinegar Syndrome. I don't think people realize. So Vinegar Syndrome, yes, name of the label, but Vinegar Syndrome also is this this process that, that film can go through to sort of deteriorate. So I, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Because I don't think people realize like what that is and how you know damaging that can be and what you guys are doing to prevent that and sort of I love that it ties back into the name. I had no idea when I started collecting. I was like, oh, vinegar syndrome. Like that's a that's an odd name. Like what does that mean? Um, until I looked it up. So I'd love to hear just like more about what that process is, especially for our listeners. I don't think that a lot of people realize um, what it means. Yeah, totally. I think that's one of the biggest, when I found out that there's a company called Vinegar Syndrome, I was just like, uh, because I came from the archiving world, I thought I was going to end up working at one of these museums or like major archives. But then when I found out that there was a company like Vinegar Syndrome, who obviously cares about this stuff and puts out really, really can I cuss, uh, by the way? <laughs> okay, really fucking, really fucking cool movies. Then I was just like, oh, that's the that's the place where I have to be. And uh, essentially, what Vinegar Syndrome is is um, there are different types of film base. Um, around uh, the early 1950s, pre that it was nitrate film. So nitrate film, uh, very known for exploding, uh, catching on fire, incredibly dangerous. It's basically made of gunpowder, and. Uh, uh, so obviously after 10,000, a hundred thousand or whatever, uh, theater fires or vault fires, uh, everyone made the really rational decision to switch to a different base and the major film base that was the next in line, uh, was triacetate and triacetate is a, uh, um, essentially it's a semi-synthetic plastic, uh, which is really great, really flexible, really malleable, and uh, has pretty good opacity and, and like uh, not as good as nitrate, but uh, is pretty is pretty good. And uh, they were like, "This is going to be safety film, and safety film uh, is going to be safe for people working in film. So it's not going to explode, it's not going to catch on fire, uh, but it will be safer." The problem with safety film and this type of safety film is it's pretty chemically uh, uh, reactive. So over a, a long period of time, triacetate decays. And when it decays, it starts to change its actual physical makeup. So it affects every single different type of element differently. Certain materials will fuse together. So we sometimes one of the things that we do is we replasticize materials sometimes where we add a plasticizer to give it the actual ability for the layers to peel apart. Um, and uh, but also it becomes brittle. And most of all, it reeks. It fucking like smells fucking horrible. And uh, there, sometimes we get material in which uh, uh, I basically open up a box that's been shipped to us and you get hit with it and it feels like a um, it's it's something you can only like experience to actually know how bad it can be but it's pretty bad but it's basically acetic acid uh being thrown off of the actual decaying film um and it's a fascinating topic it's infuriating uh there are a lot of materials which i think the original negatives are um, they, it also affects color sometimes in the emulsion. Um, so this, we really want to get to it as an issue before it gets to that, that, uh, that like crazy stage. So everything within our archive is stage two or below. I have a specific section for like stage three. Um, and those stage three materials, basically I try to monitor them and wind through them, basically giving them air giving them actual putting them in a cold environment slows down the actual decay and putting them at around 30 percent relative humidity is probably what we've found is the best uh, uh on the best environment to actually keep these films alive because it can't be it has to be dry but it can't be too dry it needs a tiny bit of moisture particles in the air to actually still uh 
um, retain its uh, plasticity. So, uh, but yeah, long story short, vinegar syndrome sucks. The company is good though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> vinegar syndrome, the label is awesome. The process exactly. sucks. Precisely. So what is, is there sort of a, I guess like a race against time at this point, like how long can these things go before it, they really start to deteriorate down to nothing? You, you know, like in a, you mentioned like they're in, you know, cellars and, and attics, you know, in just like a typical not preservation environment, like how long do you have before that stuff really starts to break down to try to go find it? Yeah, it depends on if you're storing it in your, like in your grandmother's basement or like if you're storing it here, these materials are going to survive for around like uh, probably um, before actually exhibiting some of the really bad, um, really bad decay, probably around 30, 40 years. Image Permanence Institute, if anybody is curious about it, has like a lot of great research on it, um, where basically they um, determined that there's a specific set time in specific environments. They did accelerated aging uh, experiments, which also has some issues but we we find it's like uh, probably going to be around 30 years if in these types of environments it's going to be much less for um anything which is not controlled it's not just the heat too it's the fluctuations so if you're as everybody's house is it's cooler at night and it's warmer in the day uh even that's going to cause an enormous amount of like uh, uh enormous amount of problems for the actual real because of the fact that uh, these materials are, I always say they're breathing. Uh, I think of the, my, the archive is my, they're my children, um, but uh, they're all breathing. I think of them as they're semi-organic, so they're made of living, living materials, but they expand and contract uh, depending on the actual environment that they're surrounded by. So that being said, if you're, you're storing things in like a garage, which is going to have high highs in the summer and low lows in the winter and fluctuate between night and day, it's not going to be long at all, especially for triacetate, especially in the 1970s through uh, 19, late 60s. There's a, they were figuring out a lot of stuff with um, inconsistencies in stocks. So it fluctuates depending on which, com which lab actually developed it. Um, and how it was treated afterwards. Uh, also in the 1980s, when people transferred to video, there were some dubious processes for actually like um, getting these materials onto the actual home media format, which were not safe for the film either. So we're still dealing with ramifications from that too, but um, not long is the, the long story short of it. But if anybody's curious about the, how long it is, and wants to be depressed for the rest of the day, Image Permanence Institute's uh, research on triacetate and acetate decay is a pretty good source. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I mean, it sounds like if, if anybody out there is sitting on any of these materials, like uh, get them preserved now because it's, it's definitely a ticking time bomb, um, which is, it is scary because you figure, I, I just think about how much is potentially like already lost, you know, it's it, that people didn't take care of all these, all these movies. And they're not even like movies from the, you know, 1920s, 30s, 40s. It's like stuff from the seventies and eighties is, is gone or, you know, just potentially beyond repair, I guess. Um, which is, yeah, it's scary, but luckily you guys are doing great work. Um, I did want to mention too, and talk about this. I saw you recently got a new, um, I don't know what to call it cause I'm not the expert, but a new like scanning machine, which is really cool. You like invested vinegar syndrome, invested back into the business and, and purchased this new machine. I saw it on social media. Uh, I mean, what is, what does that give you now for abilities? Is that a big upgrade for you? That's an enormous, enormous upgrade. And I think this was definitely, uh, the result of, uh, um, yeah, there's a, we're trying to raise funds for this, this upgrade. And now, the RE scan can do things faster. It can do things, do everything a little bit more efficient. So we can do, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into too much of the technical specs, but everything that it was doing before, it can now do better, <laughs> which is awesome because I, I like to think like what you said. I, I, I do think uh, like Brandon, who does the scanning, he's a like a genius uh, 
and restoration is one of the like, most brilliant people in film. And he kind of researched it and really put it on his back and made sure that like these funds were being allocated to scanning, which is in the end, this is what gets it to the, the people who care about it. Um, I can put things on cans all the live long day, but if it doesn't get out to people, we're not fulfilling our mission. So I'm really, really happy about that. I was very, very pumped that it actually uh, went through and everything worked out. And, and it was a long, long process, long process, but uh, yeah, more, more 4K UHD is coming. Yeah, for sure. That's good to hear. <laughs> That's, that was yeah. going to be my next question. I mean, it sounds like that will make things easier faster you'll be able to get more out the door i mean is that is that the sort of is that the is that the goal like i mean how much of of what you have there in the vault like are are we trying to get out to to the consumer and how much of it is just like preservation like is it Mm. i mean are are there some that you know you don't ever see happening and it's it's purely preservation or are you really trying to get like a lot of this stuff out to to the consumer and out to the world dude that's a good question yeah i think uh um yeah because it's weird because this is one of those weird like sectors of the company where in theory uh, we're doing this for the like purposes of uh we just care about the film and, and doing it regardless of the like uh the the immediate effects of doing it you know this is going to uh, affect the next 20 years instead of like the next uh year and a half of scheduling um but a good portion of materials here are um, uh, not going to are going to be here and be conserved here, but and we're trying to get it out to other companies who may be interested or like focused on that actual genre or that time 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 frame. But a good portion of it is for the purposes of actually um, keeping the materials alive because it's rare and unique materials. There's a lot of um, um, short independent uh, films, which are original camera negatives, and we care for those just the same as everything else because of the fact that uh, we think it's important, but we can't put it on a release. You know, in in the end, like uh, uh, in the end, like uh, we we don't really do these uh, uh, tinier tinier short film type things. We do focus on feature length films, which is kind of the like the bulk of the collection and uh, has like actually allowed us to really thrive. But um, a lot of these materials, uh, we're trying to find other institutions as well to either like help support um, or release them themselves. So essentially we have like just a small short list of these types of films and then um, talk to other companies, other archives, see if they would be interested in holding them too. We've already put the resources into the cans, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of sad situation because I want everything to be released, you know, but you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's an archive. Uh, my section is an archive first. I'm focusing on mainly the making sure these materials stay alive. And, um, but the other sector of it is actually working towards these bigger releases and making sure those are like ending up on people's shelves and watchable in the best format possible. So there's a lot, there's a lot of material, man. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it sounds like it. That's why I was wondering, like, you know, how much of it is, is even like releasable, like, like just, just from a business perspective, like would it, would it even make sense? Um, but you know, to that, to that side of things, like what are, what are some of your favorites that, you know, you guys have, have pulled in and, and preserved that have then gone on to be released that, you know, you really feel like you, mm. you saved, um, you know, some of the ones you're most proud of? Well, the most, the most recent one was, uh, um, uh, the, the newest one was Dog Tags. I think that was a good example of like, uh, something which I'm incredibly proud of and, um, uh, I've been told to talk more about it because it, it it's it's like it was a bit of a Sisyphean task at the beginning. Um, when I first found it, it was uh, all rusted over. It was in a really terrible can, and some moisture, a little bit too much moisture, had gotten into the can, and the actual um, sound materials were congealed together. These were the English sound materials, um, so 
essentially that was all that existed for this all this extended cut. Um, so essentially, uh, not knowing that it was ever going to be put on a schedule or anything like that, um, we were able to. I just put it in. Um, I treated it with a, um, a specific solution. Uh, and you have to store it for a long period of time. And I do it in cold storage for longer because it's safer. And this allowed the actual material to really carefully, we had to go, I had to go like frame by frame, essentially, to make sure the, the actual layers would eventually peel apart. Um, but this was, uh, in the end, uh, someone working in our in the archive store, Dino, he, he's been ranting about it for the last week where he's obsessed. So I'm, I'm really happy that little things like that can actually make a difference and teach people about the process a tiny bit. What's your, what's your dog's name? <laughs> can you hear them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, this is, this is a constant battle when you have, uh, <laughs> when you have movies showing up to your door every day. Um, <laughs> and FedEx is constantly at your house. Uh, I've got, I've got true, two. True. I've got, I've got I've got Bailey and Rosie and they're both uh like Australian cattle dog. Mm. They're mutts, but they've got a little um they're overprotective, I'll say that of the house. They're I understand, yeah. They're, the DVDs the, and Blu-ray collection, yeah. Oh, they're they're as nice as can be if you walk in. They would never stop anybody from actually stealing my entire collection, but they could deter you from at least coming into the house with the bark. Right, <laughs> they right. are completely harmless, but they sound worse than they are. Um, yeah, that's, that's the battle FedEx, UPS, the, the mailman. I mean, they're here every day. They must, I, I probably drive them nuts with the amount of stuff that's, <laughs> that's getting delivered to my oh, house yeah. every day. Um, but Hey, that's, that's what, that's what yeah. collectors do, man. We, we, awesome, we collect yeah. and we buy stuff and, um, absolutely. Yeah. So we're I did, collectors here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's the cool thing I think about vinegar syndrome too, is like, you guys are, you, you can tell that there's the collector, physical media enthusiast, like that's the mentality there and the care that goes into every release. It's not just like, you know, like you said, like dog tags. I mean, that's a movie. Nobody go, yeah. go 10 years back and it's like, oh yeah, no dog tags is going to get a 4k scan from the 35. <laughs> it, like, nobody would have ever guessed that and not only that but it's packaged with new artwork and these these the features and you know it, it's just like it's the full package and that's what i love about it like i feel like and then i'm supporting you know a small business too that's doing great work and you know hopefully some of my money can go to help preserve more film and help to get more equipment and you know the, to see the the company investing back into that makes me feel even better when i go and you know purchase stuff it's just a great great label that personally i probably came into too late i should have been buying this stuff way way before but once i discovered it i'm telling you i I'm, i've been just down the rabbit hole of vinegar syndrome because there's so many crazy titles it's like an unbelievable it's 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 the video store experience, like just the most yeah. random, but insane, but super cool stuff that you can get such I a cool label. Same. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm again, I'm also the biggest fan too, where I just get to kind of geek out half the time where I'm, I came into this late too. You know, I, I, I've, I started, uh, uh, two, almost two years ago. It feels like much longer, but everything moves really quickly here. So, uh, essentially like, uh, yeah, again, it's it's what you said. We like uh, we really do care about the collector's experience. I think um, the uh, there's so many people who have put in so uh, an incredible amount of work into making this like uh, making this happen. Like the founders, like really set the the actual stage for making this all happen. They both have their own like interests and specialties and they're actual experts in the field. Like they know exactly how to do everything perfectly. Um, so when you come into a situation like this, where you're dealing with collectors who love collectors, you just get the perfect match of a beautiful melody, you know? So I'm even, I'm still geeking out and still being like a, like fanning over, uh, what like the restoration guys do. Cause I don't do restoration, but the work that they do is like, 
like they they really make these films pop they make them actually come together and that the amount of work daily that curtis and brandon and dave sakura do it's it's insane like so they everybody here has like uh, like is an expert in their field and really really does love and care about every single one of these releases not not dog tags for some of them because it, uh, <laughs> because uh, sometimes dealing with a uh, nasty materials is not the best but you know like every single one of these releases is loved um by someone in the in this company and it's a small business which we do really try to like uh i don't know build out and put back in just like what you said with the scanner or with like we we purchase these cans from a really great company and um they also recognize that we're just people who are crazy about film and crazy enough to keep investing in a format which a lot of other people starting in the late 2000s or mid 2000s to late 2000s were saying this is going to be something of the past and now we're bringing the actual past to the present in a really like uh nuanced and cool way i think so i'm always geeking out yeah uh but i did i did want to ask you i want to ask like we talked dog tags and how rough that was right when you first got it um, I mean, what are, is there one that you really feel like you, uh, just like saved from the grave that just came in that was just like, you know, so bad that, you know, maybe, maybe you didn't think it was possible and you managed to, you know, pull it out, preserve that. Um, maybe it did get a release, maybe it didn't, but I mean, what are, what are some of the worst looking ones that you've had to deal with that have come in? Like, what's the state of those? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, there, there. I guess I, maybe I'll, I'll switch it to being like, because there are some future ones which are coming out that like uh, can't talk about in the future, which are kind of like that type of situation, and so far so good. Um, but in the past, um, there was a um, a trailer for one of the trailers for Thriller. It was pretty. It was pretty rough it was pretty, pretty rough. And it was, that was probably one of the worst, worst situations. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot that, um, it, the problem is it's like each reel has like a, uh, a time and uh cost price, you know? So every one of these things, which are really badly water damaged or vinegared, like when you, when you have to treat it, it takes a really, large amount of time and like uh we have to be really careful we have to like um make sure because essentially what it is is it's it's a like a plastic base with some with an actual emulsion put onto it so once the actual emulsion it's it's basically like um uh, i always try to think of it as like um uh like if you have a painting on a canvas or something and you scrape off the painting, but essentially film is the same. It's just a gelatin emulsion. So essentially once you damage that emulsion, uh, it can be, it can make a lot of work for the people in restoration who have to kind of like sift through and frame by frame. I mean, they always do frame by frame, but let's, some of these, some of these films come in rough, especially if the best material we had was a, a projection print which is has happened for a few things, which is it's it is what it is. Like uh, we we want the films to come out, but uh, sometimes we'll keep what we'll always do in like a, as just like a matter of uh, archival procedure is we keep the um, the that material which is very damaged by a projector or something like that. This projection release print, and then. Um, save it just in case the actual negative gets tossed or thrown out by some other person who uh, may own it. Um, but there's, for the most part, uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of this stuff can be remedied by like uh, very careful digital, digital repair. Um, the actual material side of things uh, there's some pretty bad things. There's some pretty bad ones in the archive that like essentially what you have to do is just like give it, replasticize it 
and wind it really carefully so that the actual um, it doesn't get moist and start growing mold because that can also happen. So you have to apply a fan to it uh, to give it a constant airflow for a little bit and wind it through a few times. But there's a bunch of stuff like that where it's like, um, if it's not in our archive yet and not on those shelves, I'm still stressing about it. So there's, there's like, uh, you know, even things which, um, we some there's some negatives which we we don't know where they are and there are things which would make really cool releases but again that's where my brain goes all the time where i'm just like uh, can we can we just like can we just put it in here like just keep it safe keep it safe for a little bit and then we can figure out all the egos and everything later uh trying to figure out how to put this out but i don't know there's there's so much stuff which we're always working on repairing but release prints are pretty pretty bad they can get pretty banged up like like these these grindhouse theaters in the 70s they 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 didn't give a shit they were smoking they were fucking like like um they they used to do the project projectionist kiss where they would fucking like uh like lick the emulsion to tell which side was the emulsion it's really easy to tell which side is the emulsion but these projectionists they were in the dark so they like they, they they really manhandled these uh these fucking materials oftentimes, but the negatives usually are pretty in good condition, with some select uh select uh, uh oddballs. But what's what's the percentage of stuff that you actually find like the negative for? I mean, is it is it pretty low, or do you do you have quite a few of those? Mm. Well, we've we've plenty we have plenty because i mean again this is the difference between like an archive and a library is like library is primarily for um uh, getting access materials for the for the wider community so basically as an archive we're focused on as close to what was in that original camera on set with the actual directors and stars of the movie the original camera negative was exposed to the actual light on that day. So in the end, when we actually do find something like that, it's like I, I, every time something like that comes into the archive, I'm over the moon because that's something which breathed the same air, existed in the same space and has the best possible image quality. So, um, and, and again, every single time it's duped to a different generation, somewhere down the line, it loses information. So for these um, big releases that we want to do where we present the best possible, uh, the film on 4K UHD, we really want you to be able to experience every single color gradient. You know, We want you to be as close to that actual uh, original camera negative experience as you possibly can. I mean, the original camera negative was never screened in a, on a projector, but this is going to make it look and bring you so much closer to the actual process and closer to the films itself. So we always try to, uh, we well, we always just blanket, make sure that we put the OCMs um, directly on the shelves and make sure those are cared for. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray area with a uh, uh, genre and exploitation film because it's 19, 1960s through 1980s. Um, like 35, 16, there's so many different like middle processes, like interpositive CRIs, cut interpositives, cut CRIs, cut internegatives. Um, internegative decay is different. CRIs lose color quick. There's so many different like uh, possibilities for where this could go wrong. Um, so we're just trying to focus on that latter half of the, um, the 20th century, which we do think that needs a lot more attention from archives too. And a lot of these archives are like now shifting to making sure these materials are cared for because triacetate is not going to last long. Vinegar syndrome is coming for us all. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, not the label. Uh, <laughs> no, that's coming for our wallets. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that's where they've been getting me. Um, but yeah, I always preach that if you can get, I mean, one, one example, it's always really interesting when somebody releases, you know, and I'm on sort of the, the end side of things. I see the, the Blu-ray of the 4k release, but like somebody will put out a Blu-ray and it'll be like, you know, a scan from, from the inner positive. And you're like, oh, this is, this is good. This is better than it's ever been. Um, 
But like one example recently was like you guys did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is one of my favorites. And there was a release previously that Shout Factory had done, but they scanned it from the inner positive. And when I watched that, I was like, oh, it's really good. Then I saw your 4K where you went back to the original camera negative. I mean, it's like it's like night and day. It's unbelievable. And it's honestly, I say this in a lot of my reviews, but I'm like, even if you had seen this movie in theaters when it was released, you weren't seeing it looking as good as this looks right now. Like this is such an incredible time because you're literally watching these movies in a way that nobody has ever seen them before other than like people who worked on them and edited them. Um, But it is, I I always preach that that original camera negative makes a world of difference when it's available. That, that Texas Chainsaw release was unbelievable. So incredibly cool. Yeah. When, when when everybody found out it was going to be from the OCN, we were all just like, everyone was just, this is, this is very, very cool. It's like, uh, yeah, every, and that, and that's going to continue happening, you know, uh, like, um, that, that was like a, it's a remnant of like a past, it, it's a good practice in the past where like a lot of these companies would preserve, uh, or bring, um, bring the interpositive forward. Cause it, everybody thought it was going to be safer on the OCN. You should like really treasure the, the original camera negative. But the good news is our scanners are getting to that phase now where they're really good on film. They're soft on film. They don't scratch the film. And if you have, um, we have a really great amount of like really skilled professionals in this field now who uh, know how to make sure that these materials, like scanning them, are not going to actually harm the original material. So the original material is going to be fine. We can use the OCN now. So I think this push to making sure that we get the most information onto the actual, like uh, onto your screens is just like the biggest, most important thing. We will always, in if, if you see like uh, from a release print or from an interpositive or from a CRI on one of our releases, the the fact of the matter is that's the best material. You know, we really make sure we look for the absolute closest material to that actual in-camera negative. Um, because again, every every everything about film is it's a there's a tiny bit of loss in everything. And every generation is a tiny bit of loss. So anything which can get it looking closer to that original state. That's what restoration, preservation, conservation, that's what it's all about. It's just like more information is always good. Always good. With the with the current technology, how much how much loss is there when scanning an original negative to mm-hmm. to a digital file? Um, is it mm-hmm. has it improved a lot? Like you you're losing a lot less, or is there still I mean, obviously I think viewing the original negative on a reel is, is going to be that's well without digital i guess editing and things that happen after the fact right but Mm. that would be your your purest source has the scanning technology really come a long way where like the digital version of that is is pretty pretty close it's pretty it's pretty damn good like the the like with a 4k scan you can really get all that all that detail and all that color information and like uh contrast information the um, the biggest the biggest issue is always going to be for home media formats is compression, and uh, I think uh, yeah it, it'll it's basically due to I mean I also saw your video about like uh, talking about 4K UHD uh, discs where you talked about this where it's like um, look there's a if we want to put things on um, material which is going to be accessible and is not going to take up this amount of space, every every single one of these scans um, is an immense amount of storage space, and that's because uh, a 4K scan of this type of material it's 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 enormous the amount of information we can get really really close to that original film grain. So the good news is the the, the actual masters for that material are also being backed up, you know just in case all of that material needs to be archived, the digital, the film, everything needs to be archived in case we can find better ways of compressing in the future. But um, I think like everyone in the, in the digital space, like 
at least here, really does uh, make sure all of that information is seen on the screen um, as much as humanly possible. Compression is going to continue being an issue into the future because it's money. It's money, it's time, it's, uh, you know, everything. But we're getting there. We're getting there. No, it's definitely, I mean, God, it's a lot better than it was five years ago. It's a lot better than it was 15 years ago. I mean, it's it, it's come a long, long way with, with these new formats and new compression methods. It's really incredible what they can do now. Um, so before, before, before I let you go, I wanted to ask, is there a... Uh, is there a holy grail out there that you're looking for that we can we can we can put out here to the masses and maybe somebody's grandmother does have it in an attic and they don't even know about it but you know do you have a couple off the top of your head that like oh if I found this this is the grail and there's probably a long I'm sure it's a long list it's a long list <laughs> it's a fucking long list man I think uh, if I if I blood circus would be cool. Uh, you know, it's the wrestling movie. Um, th- there's a there's a bunch of materials. If there's some, if there's like a print of like, uh, um, or something of, uh, um, I'm blanking on the name of it. Uh, th- there there are a lot of them. It's the um, uh, uh, it's the the film by the actual um, uh the director of thriller he made this other other like really cool movie which all that exists is like a print with like burned in subs or something like that and if we we could find like an actual print of that that would be the dream there's there's so many man it's it's such a it, like i mean it, for now i i always just look twice at every single um uh, i compare between different prints too for extended sequences, sometimes they cut out certain scenes and sequences and like uh, um, releases. So, I mean, yeah, that that black and white Martin would be really cool. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's so much out there. There's so much less, to, but the good news is there's so much to be found. Like we're we're going to keep finding stuff and we're going to keep searching because it's what we care about. Um, in the, in the end, like, uh, all we, all we've got to do is just have like, uh, it, it's also really important for like people who are interested in home media to also care about, uh, uh, care about these actual materials too. If someone finds one of these films or something, which is known to be lost, like let an archive nearby, you know, not necessarily us, you don't even have to contact us, but get it in the right conditions. Cause it's not just about finding it. It's about finding it and ensuring that it's in those conditions so that it can be sur- like survive long enough for the actual uh, film to be scanned, uh, put on home media, and brought to the actual people who care about it the most. So there's so many, man. It's a, it's a never-ending list. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. No, it is. it is, And it, there's so much that I hope I hope we continue to find these things and, and preserve them. And seriously, the work, you know you're doing and the whole team of vinegar syndrome is doing is incredible. And, uh, you know, hopefully everyone listening to this, if you, if you haven't purchased anything from vinegar syndrome, go take a deep dive. Cause there's some wild stuff. There's some more mainstream stuff. If that's what you're into, like I said, I mean, from beyond, I just bought on 4k Texas chainsaw. If you want, if you're more mainstream, you can get that. You want to dive down the rabbit hole. There's plenty of that too. It's such a great label. So I appreciate all the work you're doing and the team's doing and let them know we appreciate it as the collector out there, the whole media enthusiast. It's just been awesome to see. And, you know, you, you said more 4k is coming. So I'm going to, mm-hmm. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm looking for him. I'm ready for him. We're all ready for him. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for what you do too. And congrats on the hundred subs to hundred thousand subs. It's pretty big. Oh, thank you. Pretty fucking sick. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Just trying to spread the good word, keep people interested in this stuff and, uh, yeah. you know, give people a platform too. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the time. It's been really fun and, uh, yeah. you know, stay, Hey, stay in touch. And if I find anything in my, uh, my grandfather's my attic, attic yeah. I know, <laughs> I know where to go. Absolutely. Yeah, dude. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me know next time you want me, uh, rambling on for an hour. Yeah. Hey. Absolutely. Hey, cool, Jeff. Coming soon. 
Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.